Howdy neighbors, my name is Christopher Henry and I've been playing the mandolin for about 35 years. I made my living on the road uh, as a side man and a band leader for quite a long time and then I transitioned into teaching last year. I still play a few festivals here and there with my dad, Red Henry, mostly in Florida and then also in Peter Owen's bluegrass band. The point of this video is to share my perspective about learning to play Munro style bluegrass on the mandolin. I was fortunate to have a big advantage early on because my dad is one of the greatest and most prolific Munro style interpreters and David McLaughlin, the Johnson Mountain Boys, is one of our close family friends who lives near where I grew up in Winchester, Virginia. Arr! And as a direct apprentice of those two prominent Munro disciples, I was able to be at close proximity to the style and at the highest levels of appreciation for tradition, creativity, and innovation. My mom, Murphy Henry, uh, along with my father, commercially pioneered the first by ear system of learning bluegrass called the Murphy Method. She found her students' ability to actually play music that sounded good and right dramatically increased when she stopped using tablature and started teaching by ear. This takes someone with the ability to understand the music at a very high level and then most importantly to be able to break it down into digestible bites that build on each other and allow the student to develop the comprehension of vocabulary and how to listen and hear the music which are the most important and critical skills. This way one doesn't have to rely on and eventually wean off of the crutch of tablature or written music which can be a major hindrance to the developmental trajectory of a student. Everyone's relationship to the music is different with regard to taste, preference, and motivation to create. I fell in love with the power of the music early on. I wanted to play fast and really hard, focusing on some of Bill's extreme aspects, you might say. And I studied a lot in my free time as a teenager on the mountain, slowing records down, picking the notes out and phrases is an invaluable part of the process because we're relying solely on developing our ability to listen and hear better and better with listening being the beginning of hearing. Because as Axel Foley said in Beverly Hills Cop, if you'll remember, you can listen to Hendrix, but you ain't really hearing him. Something like that. Same applies to Monroe. He is sneaky that way. So I'm making this video to share with all who would like to hear my perspective with regard to what I think works the best in learning how to play in the style of Bill Monroe which is not the actual point of Monroe style in one perspective. To me, we can start with the last lesson first. The last lesson of Monroe style is to learn everything you can from the collective wisdom and the masters of the tradition, and then use that to create new music that reflects the best aspects of the past while opening up to new sounds that resonate with our hearts and our souls. So for folks that I've been working with for a while, this will hopefully be some good supplemental information to process and maybe fill in some conceptual, philosophical, or other uh, contextual and inter energetic gaps with regard to, you know, how you're going about learning your music. So this is not meant to be or sound like law or something set in stone. It's just one perspective from another serious student of the music. All right, so here we go. The study of Bill Monroe's mandolin style has three main features. The first is the vast mountain of recordings, both formal and informal, of his music played by him. Early 78 records, LP record albums, live shows, and the mysterious bus tapes type thing. The second is the study of the main master disciples through which we can focus in on the various specialties in individual style. The third pillar of the study is the individual pursuit of understanding his music in a personal way and developing one's own creativity informed by the lineage and tradition, which is the last major lesson Bill gives to us. Those that grow up around the music and culture have a bit of a head start and, and an advantage to hearing the tones, the tunes, the songs from early childhood that can allow for the lengthy processing of his language and vocabulary to begin in a natural way as if it was part of regular life itself. Many come to his music later in life when the ear is potentially more attuned to musical detail in a way, but some of the subtle philosophical and cultural essence is probably perhaps not as innately ingrained through the environment in which they came up. So the main thing that can be agreed upon usually is the importance of developing an ear for the music through hundreds and hundreds, thousands of hours of listening. The same way a baby listens before starting to talk, we've got to have the sound in our heads before it can come out. 
there are various places to start depending on which initial facets of the Monroe musical diamond are most appealing. For many young musicians, like I was, it's wanting to play the fast breakdowns. For others, it's the elegance of the stately old time, influence melodies and the ancient tones that send electricity up the spine. Sometimes it's the hardcore blues element to which folks are attracted. I certainly love that a lot. There's so much to it. Bill's music is just not one thing, but you could call all of it bluegrass. From the Smoky Mountain Shoddish to Wheelhouse, My Last Days on Earth, and beyond the scope and breadth of his creativity is near as deep as the ocean it comes from. For me, I looked to five main disciples before my generation. Frank Wakefield cracked the code first 20 years later, Red, Henry, and David McLaughlin pioneered their own tremendous styles, influencing each other, but focusing on different aesthetics. Mike Compton became very well known for espousing a lot of the blues tones from Bill's later period of work in the 70s. And then Ronnie McCurry did a great job studying and connecting David Grisman's idea of tonal character to Bill's music with great success and acclaim. And he's really gotten it out there to the masses in uh, a, a, a kind of a a way that's palatable for the popular ear, you might say. Frank has the tweakiest cracked notes and intervals. Red has the most powerful and aggressive approach. David has the cleanest and most mathematical precise tone. Ronnie blends the music into a contemporary musical landscape. Compton brings the Deep South blues into focus with his equations. These are the five main disciples I recommend studying in depth to understand more of the nuance and character of the particular specialties to which their own unique sensibilities gravitate towards and attract. The reason those five stand out to me is not only are they all true disciples who have mastered the music, but each one has had a significant and distinguished compositional career in which many, many important tunes in the Munro style have been written. This is also a part of understanding how Bill's music works. One has to be able to compose within the idiom to truly master the concepts of improvisation and bluegrass intent in a unique, creative way. Yeah, so to get a start with his music, it's good to focus on 10 tunes in the beginning. You can never go wrong with studying the Bluegrass Instrumentals album on which there are various classics, including Big Mun, Wheelhouse, Stony Lonesome, among others. It's important to learn Rawhide and Bluegrass Breakdown to understand how to develop speed and stay true to the character of the song with drive and intent. To take a good survey of the early stomps is also crucially important. To start to understand the underpinnings of the blues in bluegrass music is a foundational element that cannot be overlooked or underestimated in significance. Bill's later period of creativity yielded uh, a seminal collection of compositions in the Master of Bluegrass album, which has important tunes like Ebenezer Scrooge, Old Dangerfield, Lockwood, among others, Evening Prayer Blues. It's also important to study Bill's interpretations of old time tunes like Turkey in the Straw, which morphed into Roanoke, Gray Eagle, Patty on the Turnpike, Katie Hill, Soldier's Joy, and Old Joe Clark. Some other Monroe Jam session standards that bear well are Salt Creek, uh, going up the Big Sandy River, Monroe's Hornpipe, just a few. Another huge tune that is really important is Southern Flavor, a flagship tune of the 80s for Bill, which extends the power of the old time melody of John Henry into the modern world. So Bill would say stuff like, I would never steal another, another man's note, but I might write one tune off of another. And so, you know, and if this was happening consciously or unconsciously, we're not sure, but if you look at a melodic shape like John Henry, you'll find massive similarities to Southern Flavor, or perhaps vice versa would be uh, the way to go with that. Sometimes these tunes, and this is a bit of an outside con concept, I feel like the tunes kind of gravitate and they go to the people that love them the most, and then they nourish their music and creativity because of that love. They get the love from the tune, the tune gets the love, and then it, it moves on. And the most important tunes to our collective uh, situation are ones that never disappear. You know, I used to have a landlord, Sven Thompson in Nashville, that said they've been playing Soldier's Joy for a thousand years in Denmark, and they call it Hornpipe. So that's just kind of an, an example of how the most important tunes, they don't go away. They just kind of either stay the same or morph slightly or, you know, turn into new versions of themselves with new clothes on. So what stops folks from really getting the sound? That's easy. Not enough study, not enough study, not enough study, proper instruction, or individual effort of slowing recordings down to learn what's happening in the music accurately. What we have to understand is that 
the cats that Bill was learning from were born in the 19th century, a lot of them, with very different musicality than the modern world. And as language evolves, our collective understanding and often misunderstanding of how and why certain melodic phrases are constructed has to reckon with a hundred years of progress, however lateral, linear, or retrograde it may be within a given example. We simply can't hear and predict the notes as well as we might like to. Our ears have heard years of jams and recordings, mostly featuring watered down and often starkly incorrect to the letter and spirit versions of what Bill wrote with great deliberation and intent. A few people start saying, picking words and lines differently, then a few more, and before long, a lot of people are playing it that way who may have never even heard the actual tune the way it was in intended to be heard and played. This means we have to hold our feet to the fire and do the hard work of at least understanding where we are on the scale of zero to Bill. The fact is it's super difficult. Bill was a musical superman and made a lot of difficult things look and sound subjectively easy or simple, but it ain't. As we continue down the path, we grow new understanding in the form of new neural pathways which allow us to build on the modular pieces that we're learning to discover and decipher more of his esoteric mandolin secrets. A concept that cannot be minimized within the study is staggered 16th notes first appearing in a major way on Why Did You Wander, early recording. This ergonomic and delightful device can be a cornerstone or keystone in early development. Smooth tremolo is also a big must for its multi-pronged usefulness in slower and medium tempos, but also as the engine for breakdown speed tunes. When most of our ears are less developed, the resolution of perception can be minimal, and that's why it's really important to spend as much time as one can as early in development as possible. This can be one of the most excruciatingly difficult and challenging exercises for many reasons. But simply put, it's hard to hear what he did. It's hard to hear because there's so much information moving so quickly in his mandolin alone, but we're also contending with all the other background instruments which can influence our perception of the main melody lines. There's also a tendency to favor the fiddle lines, often which seem to be more accessible to the average ear than Bill's codified mysteries. Bill was often deliberately playing something different than what the fiddle was playing, often energetically darker and more bluesy. So once you get a few licks or billisms down, the fun really begins. The penultimate goal is to be able to hear the right sound in your head. Once this is established, then we have a chance for it to travel through our fingers and out of the mandolin. If the sound's not in your head, there's no chance or next to no chance that it will actually come out successfully with any degree of consistency. So this is where this first chapter is going to end. I'm going to do some uh, more installments along these lines, but just wanted to connect with y'all and share a few things and we'll see you on the next video. And if you want to check out ChristopherHenry.net, I've got a slew of lessons. The previews are on YouTube. Feel free to email me, cbhenry at visualink.com if you have any questions or if you want to set up a Skype lesson or something like that. I offer a lot of uh, good package deals for if you want to get the whole set of videos and also specials on like multiple Skype lessons and for new students and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So holler at me and I'll help you if I can. So until next time, bye.